Greetings and felicitations. This is Michael Haspel. Uh, on this podcast, I bring you an interview with Daniel Swenson, who is the author of A Dragon's Fate, which is just coming out. Uh, and he is the host of Dungeon Crawlers Radio, which if you are remotely a geek and haven't listened to, you're wrong. You need to go listen to it like right now. Um, I will uh, have a little bit of housekeeping here by saying that uh, when Dan and I uh, tried to do this interview, we ran into uh, technical difficulties, as you can expect, but this being an offshoot of the long war, you know, th those are expected. So it seems that by combining two podcasters, we doubled the, uh, the, <laughs> the technical difficulties. So initially we had a lot of trouble even just getting connected to work. Um, and then once we got it to work and everything, uh, we started getting some artifacts and some audio drifting, et cetera, et cetera. I have corrected, I would say, probably 95% on of that, of what you're going to hear. Uh, but there are still some artifacts in places, and uh, there's going to be artifacting where I tried to clean up some of the audio, and it didn't quite work 100%. Uh, it's You can still completely listen to it. It's very intelligible. It's not... It's not detrimental in any way, but uh, I just wanted to to call out, you know, that hey, there, I am aware that that there were some problems, and I tried to correct them to the best of my ability. So, without any further ado, I give you Daniel Swenson. Five, four, three, hands on keys, turn. <laughs> Greetings and felicitations. This is Michael Haspel, and uh, I'm here with Daniel Swenson of Dungeon Crawlers Radio, and he is uh, another author, fantasy author, and possibly science fiction, because some of the stuff takes place in the future, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yep, a little bit. Um, yeah, so uh, t tell us a little bit about yourself. Wow, uh, that could take decades. No, just kidding. Um well, as you said, a uh, podcaster. I've been doing dungeon crawlers for nearly 11 years at this point, uh, which is insane when you think about it. I've invested a full decade of my life doing this podcast. Uh, it started out as a small rinky-dink thing uh, that started in my friend's basement, which literally had bars on the window, thus the reason for dungeon crawlers. Um one day we sat down, decided to do it, and we're like, okay, who are the three people we want to interview? Uh, the three people we wrote down on our list was uh, Bob Salvatore, Tracy Hickman, and George Lucas. I've been able to... Yeah, setting the bar low there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I've been able to accomplish two out of three of those. Uh, you know, if I can ever... Uh, Score an interview with George Lucas, that would be amazing. But at this point where he sold off Star Wars to Disney, I doubt it will ever happen. However, um, it's been a long, amazing, awesome journey, which eventually led me to my passion that I've always tried to, to figure out how to get into, which was writing. Um, I remember writing stories in elementary. Uh, third grade, I wrote a story about how a tiger got his stripes. Um, it wasn't amazing. It wasn't awesome, but Hey, it was my first story I ever wrote. And I got into, you know, D and D and stuff like that because I could write adventures and do some basic storytelling and it was lots of fun. And eventually people caught on to my ability and challenged me to write. And I did. And that's where my book, uh, the shadow above the flames him uh, and developed from so i went home memorial weekend uh in 2015 and within three months i had my first draft done 
And because I set a goal that I wanted it done by Labor Day and I got it done a week before Labor Day, which was amazing. I really, really uh, gave myself a really strict schedule to follow and I was able to accomplish it. Wow. Yeah, that's really pretty cool. (laughs) Yeah. Now, it wasn't awesome. I mean, it was good, but, you know, like any first draft, it's it's a mess. You know, it, it, the words are there, but it needs to be fine-tuned and refined. And I did not know that ability at the time, uh, how to do that. So it was a hard lesson to learn, but it was awesome because, you know, the short stories I've written since in the second book, like, was super clean uh, in comparison. So I definitely learned a lot, and it was, you know, school of hard knocks. Uh, writing is a tough gig. It's something that you 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 pour your blood, sweat, and tears into, hoping someone will like it, while at the same time, you know, suffering huge amounts of criticism and other things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're not lying there, man. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and and you've just come out with your second book, which is the sequel to the Shadow Above the Flames, the A Dragon's Fate. Yeah. Yeah. So Dragon's Fate picks up after Shadows uh, Above the Flame. So it's been dubbed the Fate of Dragons series. Uh, I have always loved dragons. Dragons have been something that has always been dear to my heart as much as Star Wars and uh, superheroes have been. Uh, and I, you know, over the years, I've always tried to write the epic fantasy. You know, you've seen them out there. Um, uh, R.A. Salvatore has been a huge, huge um, part of my life, my childhood, uh, my teenage years. I grew up reading all the Dark Elf books, loved them. And I've always tried to duplicate that. I've always wanted to do that you know, epic fantasy with dwarves and elves and everything like that. And every time I would write, I, just, I, I would fall flat on my face. So I'm like, okay, let's try something different. So I, I, I kind of went the urban military fantasy with some science fiction elements to it, and it just came out. And, and I, you know, I kind of asked my question, what if dragons were real? Because every culture in the entire world has a myth about dragons, which is really interesting when you think about it. You know, what are the possibilities that every culture, even though they're very distinct and different, all have a myth about these creatures, but they don't really exist? I mean, how is that possible? Um, yes, you can probably say, well, they were just dinosaur bones, things like that, which is probably true. But I want to believe that that's not the case, that dragons really do exist. They're hiding or, uh, you know, in the case of like the movie Reign of Fire, they're they're slumbering waiting for the point when the world is ripe for the picking and then they can destroy us um, I kind of went along that that route uh, with the shadow by the flames uh, there was a kind of an evil corporation fossil fuels have ran out at this point in the world's history uh, there are multiple wars going on I mean we've seen that already uh, over in the Middle East with wars going on over gas and fuel and stuff like that. But that just kind of perpetuated the situation. Uh, and so these corporations are running around trying to find new sources. Some are you know, inventing solar panel um, technology that can be built into the frame of a car or on the, the shell of a car that works uh, really well. Others are looking for new fossil fuel resources and others are trying to develop other uh, you know, hydroelectric type engines and things. Granted, most of that doesn't come into the book, but I had to have that in the back of, you know, of my mind, just kind of figure out how this world works now. Uh, because it's very similar to what we have already. I mean, we don't have phasers or laser guns or plasma, anything like that. But we're having to figure out how to deal with this crisis. It's like set like uh, next week, kind of. Uh, you know, I would say more bit. like five maybe 10 years in the oh, future okay. but, but it could be i mean honestly it could be the end of this year next year honestly with the way it is um i don't really set a date but definitely technology has had to move fast i like being able 
to write without having to do a lot of world building. That's, I mean, it's fun as world building is. I wanted to get this book out fast because um, I was afraid if I didn't, I would fall on my face and it would not happen. Uh, so I kind of skipped the route of world building and just went with Earth because that's what we all know. It's easy. You know, if I if I don't know where something is, I can easily jump on Google Earth and zoom in and look at the surrounding street and area. But this evil organization, which I dubbed Union Forest, has found a uh, source of oil in a small rinky-dink uh, town in uh, Ardmore, Ireland. And they start drilling. And as they're drilling, they hit this giant void space and this dragon comes out and just destroys everything. That's how the book opens up, which I feel like that opening is so amazing and awesome um, that it just... In my mind, it when I was writing this, it just captivated me immediately and made me want to write the rest of the book. Yeah, that's awesome, and and I'm I'm glad you kind of brought up Rain of Fire because in like in that movie, like the dragons have been around for a while. You know, they they're like yeah. they've knocked humanity back, but we never got to see like the first dragon that got like unleashed or whatever. And it's like, you fill in that gap. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, and I wanted it to be different than rain of fire. I mean, rain of fire, pretty much everything is destroyed. Dragons are multi, you know, mass producing like rodents. Um, And I did, I did, I didn't feel like it was that way. And my dragons were very uh, unique. Uh, yeah. because we have, you know, when you look at dragons, you have the Eastern dragons, which are very, they're, they're elemental based, they're guardians, they're, and, you know, and then you look at the Western dragons and they're, they're evil, they're demonic, they're, they're you know, sometimes they're viewed, uh, in regards to Satan or something evil. Um, and they're not very often shown in a good light. Um, so I kind of wanted to find a way excuse me, to blend those two. So I kind of did, I kind of mashed them together in an amalgamation. So the dragon in the first book, the beast, uh, he, he's a, his scales are more of a, an azure blue. So he's not a typical red dragon. He does breathe fire. Uh, so it's not lightning bolts from, you know, like you see in D&D. Um, but since he breathes fire, he's kind of, he's from the element of plane of fire. So to con- he can control wind, uh, you know, he can control lightning, he can control earth, but the exact opposite of fire is water. So he expends great amounts of energy or power to be able to manipulate water. And you do see this in the book. Um, I kind of wanted to bring that into play so that, you know, if I do bring other dragons in, in the future, they can be, they can have their power based in different, in different elements there. Um, so the dragon is the big ultimate villain next to this corporation. Uh, the main heroes is two brothers, um, that have kind of had a falling out. They're both in the military, uh, Henry and Rick Morgan. Henry is kind of retired. He's set into uh, civilian life. He's not really liking his job. He kind of hates it. His boss is a dick. Um, and he worries about his little brother. Uh, his parents died in a tragic accident years before. Uh, his grandfather and grandmother kind of took them in. His grandfather died of, of a heart attack, and Henry kind of feels like it's his fault um, due to some circumstances. And then, so he kind of, he's kind of taken on the father figure, you know, the big brother father figure for his younger brother, and they've had a falling out. Uh, Henry wanted to get out of the, the military. Rick wanted to stay in. And Rick kind of stood up to his older brother. And so they haven't talked in quite a few years. And then something happens to Rick um, and his team. They're sent on a mission to Ardmore to retrieve something for Union Forest that was left behind when the dragon came out. And things just don't go right. It, it goes horribly wrong. You know, and, and that's the catalyst to get Henry into the, into the game. Um, and luckily, that is you know, started through an old high school buddy, which is kind of a nerdy, geeky guy, which I loved writing. Uh, Lenny was fantastic. 
Lenny's the type of guy that loves superheroes and comic books and is a, you know, he's a hacker, but he's a major nerd. Um, through him, I, it allows me to make a lot of like pop culture references. that still exist, uh, sort of, you know, like, you know, there's Batman references. Uh, he's got this, the secret room that's full of computer monitors and his hacking hardware, and he calls it his Batcave. Um, and so it was just really fun writing him. Uh, and then, you know, the story moves along. There's lots of crazy things. Uh, things happen, and eventually uh, we race forward to them fighting the Beast. And, and you know, since there's book two, you got to figure they, they defeat the Beast. I'm not going to say how or anything like yeah. that. <laughs> they, they defeat the Beast. They find out that there are more secrets than they realize um, about Union Forest. And that in that process, that things aren't quite as what they s- seem to be. Um, so we jump to book two, which is probably about, I would say, two or three months later. Um, thing, I introduced three new characters. Um, one of the characters briefly mentioned in the first book, uh, Marcus Silver. Marcus actually warned union force that the beast might actually be there and that and because of his report that's where henry realizes before going over to rescue rick that there's still a dragon there everyone thinks the dragon's gone it hasn't been seen for a while it may be moved on or whatever but he realizes it's there um so he goes super prepared so they're wanting to find this Marcus guy because he's just disappeared off the face of the planet. No one can find him. Yeah, and you have a, a pretty cool opening with that too, honestly. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so Marcus, he has an old college buddy that's now a, a mercenary and he's working with another mercenary. They end up finding him. Uh, he, they were hired by Lenny to, to find him while they're dealing with other stuff. And that's how the book opens, uh, with his rescue. Uh, and Marcus is... You know, he's a super smart guy, but he's a little squeamish. Uh, he doesn't like conflict. He is his nerves are shot um, because he's gone through a lot. Yeah, you know, and not only that, he knows a secret that no one else knows, and he kind of drops that secret. Um, in book one, it's mentioned that the beast came to New- to Manhattan and obliterated Manhattan, most of the giant high rises and sprawling uh, skyscrapers have been destroyed. It said that the beast lived there for a while. And, you know, because of that central park and all the animals that resided in the zoo there and uh, the pets and that were warped because these dragons have this power that just rolls off them and it mutates and warps creatures around them and plant life and things like that. And so everyone, you know, has assumed that this is the reason why, you know, you know, tabloids have always said that there's giant alligators living in the sewers of New York. Well, now it's real. Yeah. Uh, people are dealing with that and giant rats and things like that come, they come across the river. Um, and so Marcus pretty much has learned that there is a second dragon and Union Forest actually captured it. It is in one of their secret facilities. They're testing on it, and they've got this huge, massive plan. And he ends up going to Henry uh, and to tell him uh, that this has happened. Yeah, uh, and, and, and that's what I just mentioned. Uh, it's uh, not it's really, not a, really spoiler a spoiler because, because that's, like, that's like really, really early, early on, on in, in the, the book. book. Yeah, no, it is, it is definitely, and it's it's also it says it on the the, the back cover. Um, I I didn't want to really uh keep the second dragon a secret i wanted everyone to know there's a second dragon you know the first dragon um and the thing that i've loved about both of these books is there are actually scenes in the book where you're actually in the dragon's perspective Uh, most often when you're reading a book you know you're the hero you fight the dragon it's dead yeah yada 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 it talks and you have some interaction there but you actually get to see through the eyes of the dragons um which I, I really enjoyed. Uh, the dragons were my favorite part. 
the first book, the dragon is male. The second book, it's female, and it takes on a completely different persona. And you know, the the beast is a very, you know, it's a blunt instrument. It it just destroys. It just it attacks. It you know, it's you know, it's like your standard barbarian in D anD. d It just charges in and doesn't think. The second dragon is more sophisticated and subtle and patient. Um, which was really fun to write. Um, but not only that, through the story, things start developing with Henry um, and this shadow cabal that we find out about in this, the end of the first book. Um, you find out a lot more about this uh, shadow cabal, which are, they dub themselves the founders. They've been around for several hundreds year, several hundreds of years, excuse me. And they've been manipulating government and society for all this time. Um, they do have magical powers. Uh, magic did exist prior. Uh, and, you know, it, it did exist in the Dark Ages and then it disappeared. Well, it disappeared because they pretty much have been able to find a way to tap into it and draw all of its power away from everyone else. And they've been using it. So that's why magic has suddenly disappeared, and we have all these fantastic stories about dra- dragons and magic, and now that it doesn't exist, but it does. Uh, and Henry finds out he's a descendant of a knight that used to work with these sorcerers, and he has the ability to draw on this magic. And so I do blend in some, some Arthurian uh, lore into that, which I thought was fun. And... It's a really fun ride uh, with the second book because it went in a completely different direction than I thought it would. Uh, I'm a panzer by nature, so I don't outline very much. I pretty much have a starting point and an ending point, and then I just go for it. And there were some characters that I wanted to kill that actually their story arc went a completely different direction. (laughs) And there are some characters that I didn't want to kill that ended up dead. but overall, the story worked out beautifully. Uh, it was a fun, fun ride. And I just, I'm excited. I'm excited to see where book three goes. I know there's a third book. Uh, good, whether to know, good to know. Whether it's a fourth or fifth book, I don't know. But I could easily see it going that long. Um, I already have the title for this, the third book, which is called Corrupted Guardian. Um, in this second book, you actually learn that the dragons are actually were originally created to be the guardians of Earth against this ultimate un, uh, ultimate evil that's out there. Oh, very interesting. Because uh, when I was reading your first book, and full disclosure, I'm only about a third of the way into the second one. Um, yeah, it re- your dragon reminded me more of a kaiju. You know, like Rodan or or Gamera or Godzilla, um, than like a dragon from like Reign of Fire. Yeah. So again, that's me. I think dragons should be massive creatures that are so huge and powerful that they just make you want to, you know, get to your knees, fall down, and say, "I'm sorry, I'm not worthy." Um, and my yeah, dragons have four legs. Two wings and a tail and a head and a long neck. Um, they're not, you know. They're not Drogon, who are who is a wyvern. Yeah, I, you know, uh, that is the thing that drove me nuts with uh, Game of Thrones. They're wyverns. Uh, you know, the dragons from Reign of Fire, same thing. Smog, which really frustrates me because, you know, in the first Hobbit book, if when he attacking uh, Erebor, if you slow it down, that drake, that dragon that's flying by has four legs, but it's so minuscule that you miss it. Um, so it's kind of frustrating that they swapped. Uh, from a, oh, I didn't catch that. Yeah. So, you know, and even in the the, the Rankin-Baskin uh, cartoon, uh, Smog had four legs. But yeah, yeah. that's just me. That's m- my thoughts and feelings on that. Uh, but yeah, I want them to be massive. And, you know, and even the the book cover shows it that way. You know, uh, the cover, which was done by uh, Brian Hills, a local 
artists here. That dragon is huge. I mean, that's a that's a village, and it's just tromping through that thing. And that's the you know the opening scene of the book, and that's how I wanted it to feel. Um, uh, and I and I grew up loving uh Godzilla movies. Uh, you know, there's there's just something about Godzilla, this giant creature that can just rampage through a town, destroying everything. <laughs> yeah. <it does. laughs> Yeah, and then you read other books where dragons are kind of small and minuscule, and I just feel like, okay, um, cool, I guess, but that's just not my type of dragon. Yeah, definitely. And you said that you you had a lot of fun writing the second book. Um, can I ask you how long it took to write that? <laughs> yeah, so book one took three months, like I said, to get a first draft. It took me a year to write book two. Um. The reason it took so much longer is I had to make sure that my continuity was the same. Um, you know, I had to make sure that certain things were matching up with other th- elements in the, in the first book. Uh, so it did take a little bit longer than I really anticipated. And not only that, I got, I got about 20,000 words in and then realized, oh my goodness. I need to start over. Um, I mean, I still kept a lot of what was in there, but I needed to add new characters. And that's where Marcus and V and, um, and Kenzie showed up Um, because there was, there was a piece missing to my puzzle. So I ended up writing that first, uh, that prologue. Like after I was what a fourth of the way done with the book, and realizing this is the element that's missing because uh, Marcus wasn't originally part of that because he was just a brief mention in the first book. And I'm like, no, he's, he, there is another character that is pivotal and I can't figure out who it is yet. And then I sat down started asking some questions to myself. And that's what I always do when I get stuck um, when I'm feeling kind of that block. So I started asking questions. And that I, that moment when Henry is going through those reports came to mind, I'm like, what if I start with him? So I wrote his, I wrote him down started asking questions and it just started rolling out. And I'm like, he's been captured. Union Forest has imprisoned him. This is the guy. And now he, there, there's something connecting him and Henry together and Rick and things just started flowing from that point. Um, but that took me a good two weeks just to get that figured out. Um, and in that, it was really interesting because I've talked to several other authors like Chris Hussberg and, you know, Dave Butler and, and so on and so forth. And they're always like, this first sequel is always rough. It's the hardest to do because you need to match everything up and you want to make sure it's perfect and the story is moving. And I'm just like, OK, yeah. And then I started writing it and realizing, holy crap, these guys were so correct and I should have paid more attention. <laughs> um, because it was, it definitely was a lot harder. But it was more enjoyable, and it was a lot, like I said, it was a lot cleaner. I'd learned so much more in, in my writing, um, in dialogue, and in showing. Um, you know, when you're, you're running a and d adventure, you're not really showing, you're telling exactly what they're seeing. And it's definitely different when you're writing, because you need to show it instead of tell them, okay, you, you know, you're seeing this red rock and this weird runes don't know you gotta show it from the perspective of the person that you're writing with and so that was that was a big transition that really helped me learning that uh that lesson between the first and second book yeah that's that's something i didn't really think about because because so many of us get started with dungeons dragons you know and it's like uh i didn't really think about like in D D, you're always telling yeah yeah, you are, and it's 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 a rough uh, transition. Um, you know, we're when we're doing D and D in that, we're definitely storytellers. We are telling a story, but in, we're the narrator. We're going. We're saying we're telling everything that's being seen and done, and doing the dialogue and everything. But when we're writing, we got to transition that over to. We're now 
you know, showing what's going on instead of telling them. Um, which I mean, if you can get out of that mindset pretty quickly, then you're you're going to be gold uh, as a writer transitioning from D and D. And and it's quite funny if you go and talk to several authors. Um, I would say the percentage is fairly high that most of them have played D and D more than yeah. once in their life. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it, it seems there's definitely a huge overlap. I used to work in a game store, and it was just uh, really funny how many people that came in were authors or writers, you know? No, it, whether, it, it is. Yeah, whether it was a hobby or whether they were pros or whatever, but it was there was a significant overlap there. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and I think there's a correlation there. It, it's it's a training ground for storytelling. It definitely is. It helps us break free. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't know how it was for you. Like for me in high school, I was never allowed to read stuff I wanted to. It was always the material that the teacher wanted us to read. Tell of Two Cities, Romeo, Juliet, uh, you know, Fahrenheit. Uh, I can't even remember. 451. Yeah, yeah. 451. Uh, you know, books like that. Yes, they were great, but they weren't what I wanted to read. And when we wrote, you know, when I had to write papers, it was, I, you know, it had to be a certain way and it had to be said a certain way and blah, blah, blah. And I never got to really tell stories the way I wanted to. And, and I really feel like that really hampered me for quite a while. Uh, you know, like my kids now are taking creative writing classes. And my daughter wrote, you know, a, a story about this elven princess and how her uncle had killed her parents and betray, was out to kill her. And she was living in the woods and getting these rebels all joined up and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, you're you're you're, fi you're 15. And, and you're writing this massive story and, and she's handwriting it. She's not typing it. She's handwriting it in her, these <laughs> oh, notebooks. Wow. And. I'm just like, wow. And she's like, do you think it's stupid? I'm like, no, I think this is fantastic. This is amazing. I'm like, I, the only thing I would say is maybe type it up, but this is amazing that here you are at 15 and you're doing this. And she's like, oh yeah, I'm turning it into my teacher. And her teacher praised her for it. If, I, if that oh, would have yeah, been me good. in high school, yeah, I, I could just see my teacher just looking down at me with her glasses on the edge of her nose, just going, you know, doing that tisk tisk noise that she used to do, like, and shaking her head, like, I can't believe you turned this in, uh, type thing. And it's just like, I'm so glad that there's been this transition where they see that creative writing is something powerful and something that kids really can thrive in because it's so much fun. Even writing a, a, a small short story um, about nothing really is enjoyable to me and really powerful to help people you know, express themselves. I mean, uh, you know, poetry or whatever, it helps you get those emotions out. Uh, so in book two, some of the most deadly, horrible scenes that I have written, unfortunately, happened around the same time that I had something really, you know, difficult happen where I was either super angry, um, some jerk had cut me off, or something, something that had triggered me to be angry. And I just, that anger translated into words on the page. And unfortunately, some characters died horribly. Um, <laughs> but I was able to channel those emotions. And then after I, I wrote, I felt better. You know, that anger, that frustration, all that was melted away. And I didn't have to, you know, I didn't say anything mean to a coworker. I didn't say anything mean to a family member or anything like that. Uh, I was able to get those emotions out of me. And I think writing does that a lot and helps people that way. Yeah. Writing is therapy. That's cool. Yeah. No, it is. So book two, uh, definitely it was an interesting ride. Like I said, I don't want to give up too much. Um, but yes, there is, you know, every, you know, again, back to missing that there's always the battle against light and dark. Uh, God and Satan or or whatever. Um, and in this, in, in my books, 
Uh, there is the power of creation, which is positive and good. And, you know, even fire comes from creation. It's not something evil. It's not something destructive. It can destroy, but even in de destruction, it still brings life. You know, you have a forest fire, it burns out all the, the trees and that, but that's still the bacteria gets in there. New plant life comes up. It's still, it still is creative in, in some ways. Uh, then you have the negative. So I have this elder God uh, that's floating out in, in the dark void, which is separated from, uh, from our world because creation came into being and the void is non-existent. Uh, there is light, there is life. Um, you know, it's kind of like the force in a way. Um, however, one of these uh, members of the founders is actually connected uh, to this dark entity and it wants to come in and destroy all life. And it has since the dawn of time and the, uh, the powers of creation created the guardians to defend against them. And those guardians were originally the dragons. Unfortunately, dragons like us are corruptible. They have been able, they have been corrupted by power and everything else. And we learned that uh, even these guardians are, have now been corrupted and are evil. And, you know, yeah. the stories <laughs> of evil dragons have come from those because those dragons have fallen to their, their lust for power and greed and gluttony and everything else. Yeah, so you, you were mentioning that, like, your uh, your teacher wouldn't have approved, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, like, fantasy has not been kind of respectable all that long, you know what I mean? Yeah. In, in, in fact, I would say, like, until, until Peter Jackson's films, they weren't, like, even viewed as, like, a respectable adult genre, you know? It's like all fantasy stories are for kids. Uh, I'm interested in what you'd think kind of makes fantasy so special what makes it special um the, I mean, for me you know uh growing up uh you know growing up as a a, a short tiny red-headed little boy um you can imagine uh i got picked on quite a bit um and fantasy was a way to kind of escape uh, it's a way to kind of set aside things, uh, whether it's a frustrating day, whether you got picked on or whatever, you can set aside all of that and go on a journey with your friends. Um, now I'm not talking about, you, you know, your friend next door or anything like that, but the friends within those pages. Um, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I went on a journey with, uh, Frodo and Sam and, uh, fought alongside them all the way to Mordor. Or, you know, I went through the uh, the journey that uh, Tannis Half-Elven and Raceland and Caramon and, oh, yeah. uh, and Kitiara and Castle Hop Burfoot did through Dragonlance as well as Tritz and Bruner and Wolfgar did through uh, the Dark Elf books. They allowed me for, you know, a brief time every day or you know, every other day uh, to kind of escape things. And go on an adventure with them, and come back to to reality. And not only that, it's it's good, solid entertainment. Um, the, I can't tell you the number of TV shows that I, I'll sit down and try to watch, and they're just mind-numbingly boring, or there's just no story to it. Um, that's one thing. Like my kids and some of their friends love the game Fortnite or destiny or these other games. And I, I'm sure they're great games, but for me, they're really boring because there's no story attached to it. There's no, you know, I don't have an, a beginning and an end point. I don't have a, something that's challenging that I'm working towards to defeat. Uh, like in a book, you know, every book has that story arc where, you know, there's some, critical problem when we got to go do something or we got to save the princess or we got to go thwart this, this general or whatever. And when, and without that, I feel like I'm lost sometimes, you know, if watching these movies or shows, it's just like, what the heck? Um, you know, that's why I think the Marvel movies have been so successful that even though we've had, you know, kind of those villains of the week, 
in our movies, there's still been this overall giant story arc building up to where we went in for Endgame, um, which is why I feel like it really has paid off. Whereas, you know, DC's movies, as enjoyable as they've been, and I'm a huge DC fan, they just haven't had that that big story line, that big payoff, that big arc for it. Um, so for me, it's, yeah, it's just a way to escape for a little while, to go on a journey, have some fun and do things that I can't really do in reality. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got a pair of questions for you that are kind go of ahead. a mirror. So w- what, according to you would be the hardest thing about writing? The hardest thing about writing um starting uh i mean really writing those first words on a page and continuing that is super hard i mean not only is taking the courage to start writing a book because this is super personal um i don't know a single author out there that doesn't think that they're a quack or uh, that someone thinks that they're uh just some weirdo that thinks he can write or whatever. I mean, we, we've all had those thoughts run through our head. Yeah, I, I probably suck at this. I'm not good at it or, or whatever. We all have that huge self-doubt. And I think we have that self-doubt because writing a story is so personal. Even though we're not writing about ourselves, that we're still putting our emotions, our blood, our sweat, and our tears into this book in the hopes that someone else will like it. And, you know, at the same time, fearing that people are going to hate it and, and just say some nasty things uh, about it. And, you know, we, we've all had those nasty things said to us. I, I know I have. Yep. <laughs> and so it's really scary to make that first step because you, you take that step and you know that that possibility is there. No one's going to like this. No one's going to read this. Um, it may not get published, whatever. That's okay. Uh, that first step is hard. Second step that I believe is, is hard is continuing to write and reaching the end. It doesn't matter if no one reads it. In my opinion, if, as long as you can start, continue, and reach the end, you have reached a monumental goal that hardly anyone out there has done. Only a small percentage has done it. Um, you know, and that's something I have to continue to remind even myself. You know, I've got two books out, I've got several short stories out. I still have to remind myself that I, I'm in a class of elite people, even though I'm not Brandon Sanderson or Orson Scott Card or Gracie Hickman or Terry Goodkind. Yeah, you know, the list goes on. These famous big name authors. I'm still in that same elite class as them because I started writing a book and I finished and I got super lucky and got published. Um, You know, the joy is now we can self publish and it's still just as good, Uh, just as good as a platform as any. Yeah. And that that segues nicely, uh, but I'm going to have to jump back uh, because the second half of the question was uh, what is the easiest aspect of writing? The easiest aspect, holy crap, I don't know if there is an easy aspect. Um, <laughs> you know, I would have to say being a creative conduit is the easy part. We're all creative. We all have this story flowing, these stories in our mind. Um, tapping into that, I believe, is the easiest part of writing. Once we start, it's like opening a floodgate. That We open that gate and it just comes pouring out because naturally – If we're wanting to write a book and start writing, we are already naturally, I mean, as humans, we're already a natural storyteller. That's just ingrained in us. Uh, You know, we used to be, it used to be done orally. Um, We passed on traditions. But, you know, even when we're relating how our day goes to a friend or a family member, we're telling a story. Really, we are. So I think that's the easy part is telling the story. Uh, opening that floodgate and telling that story uh, because it's just natural for us, whether it's a story about how our day went, whether it's a story about our emotions, whether it's a story about how we walk the dog, we're, we're, we're always telling stories. So I think that's the easy part. 
Yeah, now to jump back to the other thing that you kind of opened the door on was like indie publishing and trad pub and everything, especially, I think it's more important now than ever, especially with like what's going on with like Waterstones and Barnes and Noble and, and a lot of the traditional venues are kind of in jeopardy. You know, um, it is interesting because, you know, it's always been, you need to be published. Now, you got to get in with a publisher. You got to have the publisher, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I know several authors that are self-published and they're doing amazingly well. And you just kind of have to scratch your head and go, what the heck? Do I really need to do that? Um, I do know some authors that are uh, published through a traditional means, through a, a publishing house. But they're also doing like novellas and side stories that they're self-publishing on the side and making a good living doing that, doing it that way. Um, and then with the changes that Barnes and Noble recently did, where they're now going to stock uh, self-published authors on their shelves, which I think is fantastic because that's kind of been one thing that self-publishing has not given you that door into those those uh, bookstores. But at the same time, how much longer are bookstores going to be around? We've already seen Borders disappeared. Uh, you know, Media Play back in the day, I used to go there to buy books. They're gone. Uh, really, we only have Barnes and Noble um, or Amazon at this point, or smaller book uh, stores, uh, which is really funny uh, when you think about it. Because I mean, if you look at like the movie You've Got Mail, that's all about the big you know book store chains coming in, destroying the little uh, bookstore chain, and you know, they're selling books at discount prices, and they're gonna thrive, and they're gonna. Just, they're, they're going to be where you go to shop, but it seems like it's flipped where those big uh, publishing or book houses have, are disappearing. And now the smaller ones are the ones thriving. Maybe I'm wrong, but it just seems like they're popping up more while the big guys are disappearing. Yeah, it does seem like the big box stores kind of are struggling a little bit more. Uh you know, and who who would have known that Amazon would have come through uh, and, and completely changed the landscape? Uh, you know, it's it's a lot like back in the day, you know, when you wanted a movie, you'd go to a, a video store and you'd rent a movie. And then suddenly we had Netflix and then we had Redbox. And now you can ask someone, you know, it's like we went and watched uh, Captain Marvel. My kids are like, well, what's a blockbuster video? <laughs> um, you know, because they don't know. Some of them don't know, and it's it's really interesting because you know I laughed when I saw that scene. Um, but it's true, you know, kids these days don't know what a blockbuster video is. They've never gone to a video store, and I wonder if there is going to be a day where we're even going to have bookstores, which would be sad. You know, everything's online. I mean, Amazon, you can buy groceries through them now. You don't even know to, need to go to the grocery store anymore. Um, I mean, how many of us go to the store? see something, and I know I'm guilty of this, see something, and like, huh, I wonder how much it is on Amazon. And I look it up, oh, it's cheaper. All right, I'll buy it on Amazon. So I wonder if we're going to still have bookstores. It's sad because they do offer an experience that you can't get on Amazon where you have book signings, which I, I'm so sad those seem to be disappearing. Uh, that was one of my favorite moments is to just – go to a book signing for my favorite authors uh, to get to meet them and talk with them for a few minutes where they sign my book. Mm -hmm. And I know you and I have been at like uh, the Bard's Tower where uh, Alexi Vandenberg, who runs the Bard's Tower, is like trying to recreate that experience by bringing in, you know, uh, authors for signings and stuff like that. Yeah, which is really cool. Uh the only downside to that is you have to go to the convention to get that experience, um, which, you know, isn't bad. There's a lot of conventions going on, but not every author can afford to go out to these conventions. Um, I wish publishers would invest a little bit more in that because, I mean, not only does it get the name of the book out, it gets sales out, it, you know, sales happen, uh, it promotes the publisher, it promotes the author. I mean, yeah. It's, but it costs money. I get that. 
money it takes money make money but at the same time uh it's a business you got to be in the black i get that it's it's tough um you know you and i have written books and we put all the work up front hoping that we'll get money on the back end uh, which I don't know if people realize that, that, you know, unless you're a bigger name and with a bigger publishing house, most authors don't get paid up front. You get paid with the sales of, of books and it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you, your, your normal nine to five job, you work, you do work up front, but you get paid on, you know, Friday or twice, or twice a week or once a month. You, you do work, you get a paycheck. We do work and we hope we get a paycheck. Um, you know, and sometimes we do. Every three months we get a royalty check. Um, sometimes we don't. Uh, and it's just, it's it's really frustrating. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's something of passion. It's, you know, I, I remember Ari Salvatore saying, if you want to be a writer, you're not writing to make money. You're writing because you want to tell stories. And that's really the best way to describe it because most authors don't make so much money that they're living off of it. There's only a small percentage. Yeah, it's 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 very tiny. Yeah. And I know I realize we're coming up on an hour here, but I had a couple other questions. Yeah, sure, shoot. Yeah, so a shadow above the flames is available on audiobook. Um, how do you? like audiobooks um how have audiobooks treated you versus like print or whatever in in my experience and this is just limited to to graveyard shift my audiobook sales have outpaced uh my print sales honestly well that's just because you got super lucky i mean I did, come on, I did lucky. Get lucky. you got michael <laughs> kramer narrating your story i mean there is if if I could, I would get Michael Kramer to narrate my book, and I'm sure my audio books would be selling like crazy. Uh, <laughs> you know, that is that is very interesting. Um, I know people will pick up audio books just because of the narrator, uh, and that's the truth. I, you know, we go out to see movies because of the actor in it or actors in it. Um, my audio book, you know, I I think audio books are great. Um, you know, we, we live very busy lives. Uh, it is a lot easier to sit and listen to an audiobook while you're working than it is to sit and read it. You know, you, to read, you have to stop doing everything. You can still do stuff while listening to an audiobook. Um, you know, I drive into work and I listen to audiobooks every morning and then on the way back home. As far as the experience with the audiobook, I mean, it's tough. You know, if you get a reader that is, not that great it really affects sales you know in your case you got a fantastic one which is generating sales just because everyone's like oh it's michael kramer let's snag this one yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. you know i think steve campbell that did my first book did a great job i do know that my publisher went with a different narrator uh this second time around uh, he's doing a fantastic job uh, but how does that translate um, I'm going to have to wait till the, the book is finished with his narration to see which is better. Uh, but audiobooks, I think, are fantastic because of how crazy and fast paced our life is. We get to we can sit down and listen to the book being read to us. Um, but at the end of the day, I still love opening up a book and flipping a page and reading through the text on the page. Uh, yeah, ebooks. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. I know. I'm going to be probably put on the spike for this. I hate ebooks. Um, I really, I really do. And that's again, it's a personal preference because I can't flip that page. I hate staring at a screen. It ends up hurting my eyes more than anything. Is um, I mean, all day long I'm looking at a computer screen. The last thing I want to do is look at you know my, my iPad or my phone to read a book. Um, I think audiobooks are much better uh, for that out of book experience. Yeah, nice. Yeah, for for me, the audiobook was, you know, you talked about like kind of the imposter syndrome, how we all have that doubt that, oh, well, I'm a hack and they'll figure it out. 
it wasn't until I heard my audio book that I was like, holy smokes, <laughs> that was actually really good. <laughs> yeah, you know, your your uh, your audio book was fantastic. Uh, sitting there listening and him doing the voices and just the way Michael Kramer um, just narrates and explains things. And I, I just sat there multiple times getting chills and I'm just like, man. I wish this was my book. Right now. <laughs> um, but no, it was really cool. I, I The premise of your book was fantastic. I love, you know, Egyptian mythology. I love mythology. And you were able to take Egyptian mythology, wrap it up in a bow with vampires and other supernatural creatures in a way that was entertaining. And it was kind of realistic in a, in a fantastic way. It's like saying, you know, hey, there's, you know, these supernatural creatures are still around. You don't really know it, but, you know, you know it, because of this reveal, they're now here. It's now part of society. They've secretly been, you know, getting you ready for this point. And now it's like, who cares? Vampires are there. Uh, yep. I mean, so much <laughs> to a point, there's one character in your book that fakes that he's a vampire just so he can get a girl. Yeah. <laughs> I laugh so hard uh, at that point because I was like, oh, my gosh, really? It, uh, but I could see I could see some really lonely guy doing that uh, in that world you created. Like, man, th those vampires are always getting girls left and right. I'm going to fake I'm a, I'm a vampire. Yeah, there we go. Um, so it was it was just fantastic. And then Michael, you know, because I did read it before the book. And I enjoyed it. But then with Michael Kramer doing the narration, it just brought it to life in such a completely different way that just made it epic. Yeah, he did take it to the, like, the next level. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now Hollywood just needs to make a movie out of it. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the last question I've got for you, and then we'll like uh, wrap up, is uh, – like what stories do you feel most influenced you as a child uh, and then as an adult? And it doesn't have to be a book. It could be a film, TV, whatever. Oh, oh, um, if I list off that, it's going to be forever. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, books, the books that most influenced me uh, growing up would definitely be uh, Dragonlance novels and R.A. Salvatore's Dark Elf series. Those. Uh, really before then I didn't really enjoy reading. Reading was just kind of, eh, um, my parents didn't encourage it at the time. Uh, you know, I was only reading what they had us reading in school. When I got into those books, the love of reading really ignited in me. And it was like, wow, this is amazing. This is a journey. This is fun. I'm enjoying this. I devour books at, at that after that point. Um, and I still have many of those books even now. Uh, my kids make fun of me because I never break the spines on any of my paperbacks. Um, but I have one set of, I have about 10 books that the spine is broken because I have read those books so many times. Even as an, an adult, I've reread them and I've just enjoyed them. Uh, movie wise, uh, Star Wars definitely. Star Wars is, oh, yeah. is a huge oh, yeah. influence in my life. I am I have been lucky enough to be at every Star Wars movie in the theater. Um, I was born in seventy seven, so yes, that does count because I was an infant. But hey, um, I have been in love with Star Wars forever and a day. Um, there is just something about the storytelling. There's something about the setting. Uh, it's just fantastic. It has been so pivotal, uh, pivotal. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm so emotional over it. I'm, I'm tripping over my words. So pivotal. Eh, never mind. I'm just not going to say that word at all. Uh, it's just been huge in my life. Um, I'm sitting here in my office and there is just Star Wars stuff all around me. Um, it is just, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's made a huge impact on my life. Um, then there's so many other movies, uh, you know, like old movies, 
uh, Danny Kay is one of my favorite actors as well. Uh, you know, court jester, inspector general. Um, he's just a brilliant actor that was funny and he, so much of his expression in what he was doing was in his face and his body. And it didn't, and it, you know, no, it did help. It did help that he was a redhead. Um, you know, that someone that had gone through the trials, I mo more than likely did as a redhead, uh, could be successful and funny and still, uh, be an actor, uh, was very uh, pivotal for me. And I mean, there's so many other movies and, and things like that uh, that just really ingrained uh, a sense of storytelling in myself. Uh, like I said, Godzilla movies, I watched them as a kid. Old John Wayne Westerns. Uh, my grandfather watched those all the time, and I watched those with him. Uh, those. It is one day to, my dream to write a Western. It's probably not going to be a traditional Western. It'll probably have some supernatural or dragons or something yeah. element to it or dragon yeah. element or something. Um, uh, honestly, I, I would be over the moon to see, to read a Western that had dragons. <laughs> yeah. Um, that may be happening very soon. Uh, probably more than that. Cause I'm already 30, 40,000 words into it. Uh, <laughs> nice. nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have been working on that because I have this vision of this guy, old West get up, duster, hat, uh, six shooters in hand, just, you know, dusters flapping in the wind, and he's just unloading his uh, revolvers on a dragon. Uh, just amazing. I got to figure out how that's going to work because, you know, the weaponry is definitely not up to par what it is in the, these other two books. but. Um, it just seems like an awesome mix, doesn't it? it you know, old it, west it really and dragons. Does. I mean, we've seen Cowboy and Aliens, which was okay. Um, it was a it was a decent movie. We had Harrison Ford and Daniel Craig in it, but it didn't seem to blend very well. At least in my mind, it was fun to sit and watch. But Cowboys and Dragons, I think, would work. Uh, not only that, in you know, Native Americans uh, do have legends of dragons, so I think I can make it work really well. Nice. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> but you know uh yeah again i like most of us i'm sure there is so much that has influenced us as writers and as children um growing up as become writers um uh, that is the fantastic thing uh how society and things have changed because i mean like when we were kids D D, uh reading fantasy books and all that was kind of shunned that's something you kind of did at home in the closet you didn't really talk about it now it's like, yes, we do this. It's it's second nature. It's part of our culture. You know, we're running out and seeing the next Marvel movie, or we're going out and seeing a movie about Tolkien's life, or we're going to see Ben in Black International or John Wick or whatever. Um, these are all fantastic stories that have elements to them, and these are all people telling stories now. There were kids when we were. And they grew up at the same time, and now this is acceptable, which is yeah. just amazing. Yeah, and I, I joke with folks. I go, the legacy of of Marvel is that those movies are so popular. My mom knows who Tony Stark is. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, what what is that like to to sit there? You know, because you know, I remember back in the day talking about comics. Who is this character? What what? You know, and now now they know. You know. Now it's it, – yeah, it definitely is a lot easier because you have Robert Downey Jr. playing Tony Stark. People know who Tony Stark is because of that portrayal and these movies. Um, you know, there – you know, there's other actors. Like, you know, I got to meet Mark Hamill in, in person, and that was so amazing for me to meet Luke Skywalker. I – you know, I, I can't tell you the number of times – um, I've watched Star Wars over and over, and this is Luke freaking Skywalker in front of me, and I got to meet him, and nicest guy in the world. But to me, you know, my kids are like, some dude, what the heck? But to me, that was huge because he was a major part of my life. Um, as a kid growing up and watching these Star Wars films, and 
you know, I, I've seen my kids geek out on some other uh, celebrities and that going to these cons. And so I've got to, you know, to do a little payback with them. Um, but, you know, it is, it is interesting to be, because, you know, as an author, we're not quite that celebrity status. We're not that movie star, that actor, or anything like that. But I have had several people that have come back to me. They're like, wow, I've really loved your book. This was amazing. And, you know, they want to know when the second book comes out. And they want to ask all these questions like, oh, you know, in this scene, you did this. Does this have any connection with that? And it's so amazing where people reading see more than you saw when writing it or or trying to find connections and or, you know, they their emotional connections that they had with these characters or within the pages. And that just brings me a lot of joy. You know, there's a lot of negativity out there, but when someone comes up to me and says these positive things, it's like, wow, okay, it's worth it. All yeah. the headaches, all the pain, it's it's worth it, you know, yeah. uh, for that yeah. one person to come up to you. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's pretty incredible feeling. Yeah. But now second book is out. Hopefully people like it just as much. Um, if not. But so far okay. I'm liking, so far, it, I'm more. liking it more. Yeah, a lot of people are saying they like it more, and I, I honestly have to say it's because my writing has improved. One, two, the first book was just kind of I wrote it, thinking okay, I'm writing one book, I'll put a twist at the end in case they like it enough to uh, say I can write a second book. The second book, I'm able to pull this the threads out of the quilt and say, okay, now we're really picking up some speed and going in a different direction. And um, that is the feedback I've gotten. Uh, a lot of people said, wow, this second book is so much better. And thankfully they didn't say it was worse because that would be really bad as a writer to say <laughs> your second book is not better than your first one. Cause every book should be better than the last one in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what we would aim for. Yes. Yes, because if I if it was worse, then I really underachieved, and um, I need to think of something else to do. Yeah, and we're a little bit over on time now, so uh, can you just let everyone know uh, where to find you online and where to pick up your books and stuff? Okay, so obviously uh, everyone can tell I can talk. That's why I have a podcast. But so uh, as far as the podcast, you can find us at DungeonCrawlersRadio.com or DCRShow.com. That'll take you there. Um, the podcast is about all things geek. We talk about movies. We talk about games. We talk about we bring authors on to talk to them to talk about their books. Uh, we talk about pop culture and, and everything like that. Uh, where they can find me for my writing, uh, which is my website dragonsfate.com. Uh, that's where there's links to for the books. Uh, you can find the books up on Amazon. The first one is The Shadow Above the Flames. The second one is The Dragon's Fate, and that's part of the Fate of Dragons series. Um, there's also I also have short stories in uh, the Valkyrie Awakenings anthology and the Choose Your Own Apocalypse anthology. And then there's a couple more that will be coming out soon. Um, you can find me on Twitter uh, and Facebook. Uh, Facebook, it's at author Daniel Swenson. Um, on Twitter, it's uh, it's Daniel Swenson seventy seven, and uh, Instagram, it's the same thing. That's where you can find me on social media. I really need to do a better job at posting daily, but I post as often as I can, and um, I do answer. You know, there is a contact me, and I I'm the person that answers you. So if you have questions or anything like that, I'll be more than happy to answer those. Well, cool beans. Thanks a lot for coming on. Um, we hang out at Fanex, so I, I've been wanting to have you on for forever. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. And, you know, um, you know, thanks for having me on and it has been great. I know I, I brought him on Dungeon Crawlers a while back and, um, yeah, it, it's been great, uh, chatting with you and getting to know you. And I, I, again, I would really love to get, see the sequel to Graveyard Shift because that was a fantastic book. I enjoyed it. And, you know, I, the one thing I would say to anyone, I know we're, we're over on time a little bit, but uh, reviews are so critical that that's yes, the lifeblood yeah. of authors. Um, 
you know, that's how we survive is through those reviews. Uh, you know, even if it's you're giving a bad review, you didn't like the book. Uh, the thing I would suggest is be constructive in your review. Uh, even a review that's negative but gives constructive feedback and criticism is very helpful. Uh, you know, the first book, uh, there was several that were really just crap. They were nasty. Um, but there was one in there. It wasn't super bad, but they gave constructive feedback. And I'm just like, okay, yeah, I can see that. And that helped me to improve as a writer. So uh, constructive feedback really helps us improve our writing and improve the story. Um, but it also isn't like a drop kick to the nuts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because that's what it feels like when you, you read those. And yes, we do read those. Um, so if you're going to be, if it's going to be a negative one, be constructive, but definitely, you know, give us, give us that review because that's how the publishers know we're doing well. That's how our rankings get up. And that's how people want, know to buy that book because believe it or not, when people are looking at Amazon, they're looking at that ranking. And if you have an average of two stars compared to someone else looking at that has an average of four, yeah, they're definitely going to go for that four star. Yeah. Yeah. And and leave them on Goodreads as well. Yes, Goodreads as well. Uh, that's another great place um, besides Amazon. So please, please leave a review. Yeah, that's a solid point. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we'll end it there. Um, and so, uh, once again, thanks for being on. I I will see you probably in September at FanX. Oh, yeah. Yep, I'll be there in September at FanX as well. And um, I'm sure we'll eventually run to each other at other conventions or places. You have been listening to Quantum Froth Dispatches by Michael Haspel. Music and other cues are provided by The Fat Rat. The song you're hearing is Monody, featuring Laura Brem. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit www.patreon.com slash QFD. Thank you for listening, and we now return you to your mundane reality.